once again. My name is Chris, and it's my privilege to bring the Word of God to you this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, if you've turned to the Gospel according to St. Mark, Mark chapter 2, and we're going to start at the beginning of chapter 2 and read the first 12 verses. It will come up on the screen. Um, it'll be the ESV version on the screen. If you have a different version in your, on your lap, read that one or follow the screen or listen to me. But it's Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And when he returned to Capernaum some, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And as he was preaching the word to them, oh, and he was preaching the word to them, sorry. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive God, uh, forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. He rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that we have the holy scriptures in our hands. Lord, what a privileged people, what a privileged nation we live in where the word of God is freely available to us. Holy Spirit, I pray, be our teacher this morning. Clear our minds of the world that bombards. Clear our minds so we can, can see and hear and learn from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. When I came in this morning, I gave Richard the little note to say, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, and he said, uh, what's the title? What's the title? Because they like, we like to put the title on the web page or on the discs or whatever. Well, what is the title? We never saw anything like this. Could be the title. Trouble with the authorities. Because we're going to look at chapter 2 and a little bit of chapter 3 where there is trouble with the authorities. And we saw a little bit here. The scribes were thinking, hmm, who is this? Could it be through the roof? Or Jesus is in the house. I said to Richard, Richard, you take your pick. <laughs> you choose. You choose the title. Welcome to chapter 2 of Mark. Last week, or the last two weeks, Roger so excellently went through chapter 1 and set the scene for us. Excellent. And I do recommend you go onto the webpage and, and listen if you, if you weren't able to be here. Um, and here in chapter 2, we read the first thing that happens is that Jesus heals a paralytic man. So I want you to be movie directors today. You have the script, you've read the script, and I want you to, in your mind, set the scene. Have a go at being a movie director. So let's look at the account. The scripture says that many were gathered together, that there were so many people they could not even get in the door. Clearly, people were trying to get to Jesus, flocking to him, coming, crowding to him. 
even that doorway, even the entrance, even around this house, there were crowds of people. How did they get to hear that Jesus was there? How does God get a crowd together? Any evangelists among you would say, oh, I'd like that question. I'd like to have the answer to that question. How do we gather people to hear the word of God? Well, in chapter 1, which we went through the last couple of weeks, in verse 28, it said his fame spread everywhere, throughout the surrounding areas. Jesus' fame was spreading. In verse 33, chapter 1, it says the whole city gathered together. Imagine the whole of Cockermouth coming to this building, cramming in to hear the word of God. Just, to let, just imagine that. I mean, at uh, the uh, Christmas light switch on, we get a lot of people in Main Street. Imagine if everyone from Cockermouth came to one building to hear the word of God. In verse 37 in chapter 1, it says, Simon and the others are saying, everyone's looking for you, Jesus. The word was getting out. Everybody was looking for him. And in verse 45, after cleansing a man of leprosy, a man that was a leper, outcast, out of the town, not allowed into the community because of his leprosy. And Jesus healed him and said, don't tell anybody. Just go to the priest and show yourself, but don't tell anybody. Well, the man could not contain himself. He went out and told everybody to such an extent that Jesus had to leave the town. The crowds were marauding. To, there were just so many people wanting to get to Jesus. The news spread of this mighty experience of God's presence, the miraculous uh, hand of God upon man. And there is a magnetism. Many years ago, over 20 years ago now, in the mid-90s, there was something happening in a church in Toronto, and many of you may have heard of this. It was nicknamed the Toronto Blessing. This little church by an airport in Toronto, Canada. Little church building, not very big, a couple of hundred people, I guess. And there was something happening. The presence of God was getting bigger and bigger. Every time they met, there was almost like the tangible presence of God to such an extent that it, the news spread not only into Canada and to the United States, but over here on this side of the Atlantic. And folk were flying across the Atlantic and up and across the, the, the Midwest. They were flying in. I went. Gail went, although we didn't know one another then. That would have been amazing to, to think that we were there together, but we, weren't, we didn't know one another. A group of us from the, from the South went, and it was phenomenal. Every evening, the presence of God was there. So much so that the church had to buy another building, a bigger building, a warehouse building, still near the airport, to accommodate more. And the hotels were full. The hotels had shuttle buses to take you from the hotel to the meetings. It was full. There were thousands of people coming. So much so the church said, look, on Sundays, please don't come. Because it is our local church on a Sunday. Please don't come. Tourists, go and look at Niagara Falls. Go shopping or something. Don't come to church on Sunday because it's our little church. But you're welcome to come Monday through to Saturday. You can flock in. And they did. At a prayer meeting this Thursday in the hub, Thursday morning, we were praying for more of the presence of God to come among us here in Cockermouth. Churches in our towns. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the tens, the hundreds, the thousands come and hear the word of God? So here Jesus was, crammed in this house. Folk crammed in. What was happening inside the house? Jesus was sitting among them. And what was he doing? He was teaching the word. Were folk lining up for prayer? No. They were listening to the, to the word of God from Jesus. Now, some folks say, yeah, no, Chris, I love the worship. Oh, I love to get lost in worship. I love the, the, when the Spirit leads. And, oh, I love the words, the prophetic words and the pictures. And, you know, and that can mean clapping. That can mean my going down on my knees. But oh, the word, a bit of a boring bit, isn't it? And I can always catch up online after. It's a bit boring. I, I don't know. Obviously, you guys here, you like the word because you're still here. But, but there are folk around in, in the nation that think, well, no, I, I dislike the worship bit. I like the spirit bit. 
not so keen on the word bit. But you see, we are people of the word. This church takes the word seriously. We take time to prepare our sermons. And we explain passages in the Bible. We teach the truth in a way that is relevant to our understanding today. We don't change the truth. The truth is the truth. I sound like a politician here now, don't I? But in a world where we can't trust the press, we can't trust the media, what is true nowadays? This is true. This is the rock on which we can stand. This is the truth. There's so much stuff going around in the news and newspapers, as we all are fully aware. What can we know? The Bible is the truth. You see, if you have the spirit, you will honour the written word of God. And we test everything by his word, the spirit and the truth. And Jesus here was teaching the word of God. He would obviously have been referring to the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written there because this is an account of him in, the, in that story. The Old Testament, the, is that a relic from the past? No, that was Jesus' Bible. That was, that's what he would have studied and, and learned from and shared. Okay. So many have come. Jesus is preaching the word, word and then the unusual takes place. And when the unusual takes place, we can become a little bit sceptical, a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit uneasy, even a little bit fearful. We don't like the unusual. We like everything to go to plan. When Peter, the fisherman, was in his boat and he saw Jesus walking on the water towards him. He said, Jesus, is that you? And Jesus says, come, Peter, come. And Peter climbed out of the boat and walked on the water. And then fear struck him. This is too unusual. I should not be doing this. And he began to sink. And Jesus immediately put his arm out and says, Peter, come on. It's me. When the unusual happens, we can have a reaction. We can have a feeling. But something was about to unusual to take place here in this passage. With a crowd both inside and outside pressing in to hear, to hear Jesus preaching, there were four guys with a man on a stretcher, a paralyzed man on this stretcher. And these five guys, four guys and the man lying on the stretcher, these five of them had heard of the miracles. Fame had heard, they had heard the fame. They were aware that something was happening. So they planned to come to Jesus. But there was no way they could get in. They arrived late. Obviously, they, they were, just couldn't get in. So what did they do? Oh, well, that's that then. We tried. Oh, well, fair enough. People got here first. No, they were determined they were determined to get to Jesus. If it is the will of God, he will provide a way. If you have difficulty to get through, don't be daunted. Seek the way. God makes a way. Now, the buildings at these, time, these times would have had flat roofs. And they would have had stone or wooden steps going up at the side to give access to the roof. And the roof was very useful. You could put your laundry up there and hang out your washing to dry. And it, was an extra, it gave extra space to the house. Now, we used to live in Mexico, as many of you know, and every house we rented had a flat roof. And it's where you did put the laundry and you had the water tank up there. It was, it wasn't, um, it was made of steel, uh, steel girders and concrete, but it was a flat roof. And some of them didn't have much protection, so they could easily fall off. But here in the story, there would have been a flat roof. And it would have been made of wood and beams uh, and some bracken and, and, and stuff. And then they would have had like a, uh, tiles made of mud and clay to go over to keep it waterproof. Whatever uh, you're thinking, it's not a Cumbrian slate roof. OK, so get that out of your mind, it was a flat, muddy type of roof.
They're determined to get in. And their determined to, determination allowed them to unroof the roof. You see, if an opening to Jesus cannot be found, we must make a way. And they made the way. They removed this obstacle, which in this case was the roof. Now imagine you're inside the house. You got there early. You got up early, had your breakfast early, and you thought, I'm going to get there early. I'm going to get right into this building. I want to hear what's going on. You're not necessarily a follower of Jesus, but you want to find out what's going on. So you get up there early and you get a good position. You're sitting on the floor and Jesus is right there in this room and you're listening to every word. And it's, it's getting hot in there and it's crowded. But you thought, well, no, and you're with your friends. And you think, yeah, this is good, isn't it? Yeah. You know, wow, this is good. And then suddenly there's a kind of a, 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 a dusty mist in the air suddenly starts appearing. And this dust is falling down and you think, start brushing off your shoulders and and you look up and you think, mm, I don't know, there's some dust coming down. And then the dust gets a bit stronger and there's kind of bits of dirt coming down. And you think, strange. And then you start to see uh, bigger pieces of mud coming down. And you're thinking, well, this is a little bit dangerous, but OK. And then there's a, a little shaft of light comes through. And you're nudging your friend thinking, I don't know what's going on out there. And this hole starts appearing. And it gets a little bit bigger. And it gets a little bit bigger. And there's kind of bigger clumps of mud falling down. And you think, well, this is, Jesus is still sitting there teaching. Everybody's still in the room. And you look up and this hole is getting bigger. And then, then you see four heads looking in. <laughs> and you're looking up thinking, what on earth? Is going on. And then after the four heads come in, the hole gets a little bit bigger, then you start to see this wooden bed coming through the hole. Now, I don't know what Paul would think about health and safety about that, but, <laughs> but this bed is coming through the hole and there's this man lying on the bed completely paralysed. And you're thinking, and, and others start to get up and they start to assist more because they don't want the bed to hit them on the head. I mean, they, they start assisting, you know, with somebody to help. And the bed is brought down, the four guys jump down through the hole and they're in there and they put the bed with the paralyzed man in front of Jesus. The unusual is happening. It's not what they thought would happen. Something unusual was happening. And you're thinking, what on earth is going on? Jesus says nothing about the dust, nothing about the mess, nothing about this disturbance, nothing about the irreverence. Jesus is not offended by the roof removers. Jesus saw their faith and it blessed his heart. It blessed his heart. Their faith enabled them to get this man before Jesus. Their faith can overcome. They believed they could get this man before Jesus and they allowed nothing to stop them. Not even a roof. A huge crowd, no problem. I'll come through the roof. They believed, and their faith and trust was in God. They were people of faith, overflowing faith, confident faith, glorious faith in God our Saviour. What great friends this man had. What wonderful friends to have. If you are in a circumstances at the moment, and you feel paralysed, unable to move, reach out to friends with faith. They will help you see you through. This paralysed man could not do this on his own. Bring a heart of faith to Jesus. Ask for the unusual. Jesus is in the house. What happens next? What does Jesus say? 
Well, the first thing Jesus says is, Son, your sins are forgiven. Strange. You may think, well, that's strange. Yeah, uh, Jesus, the man is paralysed. Aren't you, aren't you going to heal him first? Maybe have a little chat with him afterwards, kind of, uh, you know, see how he is before God, have a little chat with him. But no, he's paralysed, Jesus. Why, why are you saying your sins are forgiven? No, heal him first. Because you did that with the, with the man, the leprosy man, on the previous chapter. Uh, why are you um, saying your sins are forgiven? When Jesus is in the house, there is forgiveness. And Jesus starts with sins being forgiven. Jesus deals with the man's spiritual condition. You see, that is man's problem. Not everyone is paralysed. Not everyone needs healing, but everyone is a sinner. Everybody needs their sins to be forgiven. So Jesus says it first, son... Your sins are forgiven. In the commentary written by Edwards, Mark Edwards, he says, Jesus wouldn't heal the body and neglect the soul. He could not remedy a temporal condition and leave the internal condition untouched. What a wonderful announcement Jesus said to this man. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now on earth, in this life, this man's sins were forgiven. He had present day assurance of forgiveness. Do you have that? Do you have assurance today that your sins are forgiven? You see, all who put their faith in the Lord Jesus can say, yes, yes, Chris, I have that. You see, many of us can accept a lie that, well, some of my sin was too great for God to forgive. So the cleansing of that sin is now my responsibility. I've got to work at that. I've got to do a little bit more because that sin I can remember, yeah, that one, but that was a biggie. I've got to work on that one. Well, that's not the gospel. That is a lie. That's called works. The gospel is grace. Yes, there were big sins, but yes, God can forgive. He came, to the he came into the world to save us from all our sin. This is a major part of Jesus' ministry. Sin brought us into ruin. Christ died for our sins. What a wonderful message. For those who are burdened and guilt-ridden, Jesus came to forgive sins. Period. Big sins, little sins. He came to forgive sin. How does God do this? Well, Jesus laid on Jesus. His beloved son, the sins of all of us, all our sins were laid upon Jesus. Directed to him personally. Jesus became the sacrifice. He took the punishment that we deserved. He took it and not us. That's the grace of God. That is the gospel. Jesus removes our sins, as the Bible said, as far as the east is from the west. There is no greater blessing this side of glory in the knowledge or the realisation that we can come into God's presence knowing our sins have been forgiven. There's no greater glory. There's no greater thing that we can come and worship God. We can give thanks to God. Our sins were placed on Jesus and he took our sin. Jesus, dying on that cross, taking the punishment, forgiving our sins. No longer come under the wrath of God. Our sin separated us from God. How can the sinful meet the Holy One? It could not take place. How can sinful man stand in front of the most holy God? Couldn't happen. So God made a way. He gave us 
his perfect, sinless son and only son to take away our sin. Christ died as a punishment for our sin and now he's raised up as we've sung over those wonderful choruses this morning. Now we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. Christ took our sin and gave us his righteousness. Hey, I'll take your sin. Let me take your sin. You have my righteousness. That's the truth of the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the good news. So we can come into his presence. We can come into the presence of the most holy one clothed in Christ's righteousness. This is the gospel message. This is the good news. Sin's gone. Conscience now clear. Some of you may be hearing this for the first time. Some of you may be thinking, I've, I, I'm hearing this for the first time. The good news of the gospel. Son, son, your sins are forgiven. Even the word son, some, some translations say my son, is not just a term of endearment, but a term of authority. Son, I'm your father. You're my child. You are forgiven. Oh, that's why we can go a little bit crazy in worship. We think, oh, God is our Father. But at this point, the scribes sitting there, they got there early too. They're inside and they're listening and they're watching and they begin to think, oh, wait a minute. Who is this man saying to give, forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. This man is a blasphemer. And what do we do with blasphemers? We killed them. They were only thinking that. They didn't actually say anything at this stage. They were thinking that. You see, Jesus not only knows the, th the sins of the paralytic, he knows the thoughts and the hearts of these scribes. And what does Jesus do? He asks a question. And he says to these scribes, which is easier to say to this paralytic man, your sins are forgiven, or is it easier to say, rise, Take up your bed and walk. Which is easier, forgive sins, spiritual, or heal, physical? Jesus says to them, well, which is easier? What do you think is the easiest way? What's easier? Well, on the surface, of course, it is easier to say the words, your sins are forgiven. Because there is something invisible and impossible to disprove. But it's harder to say, take up your bed and walk to a paralysed man because if he doesn't get up, then the one who says the words has no authority to heal. So what does Jesus do? He shows his ability and his authority by saying to the man, pick up your bed and go home. Go on. Walk out of here in full view of the crowd Inside and out, you came through the roof, you're going to walk out of that door. Just freeze, freeze frame your, your movie director's thought here. Just freeze frame. Jesus said to this man, get up, stand up, pick up your bed and walk. And he did. And he did. Look at the faces in the crowd. Look at the amazement. Look at, just read the faces. You're a movie director, you're panning around, you've got the, got, just look at the faces. The man stands up, picks up his stretcher and left the room. Remember, minutes ago he was paralytic. His legs would have been wasted away, the muscles would have gone. He could not have stood up, let alone pick up his bed. And Jesus, with the authority, the same, the same authority that his father had when he said in Genesis, let there be, let there be light, and there was light. It's the same authority. It's the same power. He says to this man, get up, pick up your bed, and walk out of here and go home. And the man picks up his bed, puts it under his arm, says, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, make way, make way, I'm coming through with my bed. I don't need it now, but Jesus has told me to take it away. 
I'm going to take it home, I'm going to put it in my bedroom, and that's going to be a permanent reminder where I was. And I can look at this stretcher and say, that was me at one time, but now look at me now, and that's God's doing. Make way, make way, and the crowd would have opened up, and he would have walked out. Look at their faces. Did it really happen? But, but what, uh, what, who? Did you see that? There would have been a stillness and a hush in that room. Jesus is in the house. And their response was to glorify God. It's all about his glory. We are thrilled God is glorified. At a recent prayer meeting, guys, the prayer meetings at the moment are places to be at. The recent prayer meeting, God said to us, reset your expectations. Recalibre your thinking. Because the kingdom of God is here. Jesus is in the house. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up in a moment to play one more song. And this morning I'm going to do something that we don't often do it this way here at King's Church. But I want to give an invitation. I want to give an invitation to you all. And I feel that there are some here that have never really understood this gospel. They've never really understood that their sins can be forgiven. But the truth is, your sins can be forgiven. Jesus is here. He's in the house. Your sins can be forgiven. Put your faith into Jesus. And I'm going to give an invitation that while the song is playing, I'd like you to actually come to Jesus. Now, there's nothing more holy in this bit of the room than it is where you're sitting. I know that. We all know that. But there is something about the physical and the spiritual coming to Jesus. They carried this man through the roof. They made a hole in the roof publicly in front of all this crowd to get this man down. Is Danette, you want to come up? Or whatever. They, they carried him down some, and they brought him to the feet of Jesus. So today, if you've heard this for the first time and you thought, I've never really, I can't live with the assurance that my sins are forgiven. I don't really know that. Well, today's your opportunity, and when the music starts, I'm going to ask you to come forward and just stand here. You're standing in front of Jesus. If you want to bring a friend with you, great. If you want to come on your own, great. If you want somebody to pray for you, we will obviously do that. If you want to just stand there on your own with Jesus, that's fine. I also believe that there's folk here today that want to come again. They want to make a fresh start. Your circumstances are such that you've come to Jesus in the past, but you still feel paralyzed. You can't move on. And somebody said to you 20 odd days ago, Happy New Year, all the best for 2017. And you're thinking, if only that were true. This year is going to be a repeat of last year. If only that were true. But you say, oh, thank you, thank you, happy new year to you. But you thought, no, I'm paralysed. I can't seem to move on. I need, I need, a, I need to come in the, to the feet of Jesus. And I invite you to come and stand at the feet of Jesus. Bring a friend. Come on your own. Jesus is in the house. The King is here. Come forward as the song is being, as we're singing together. Come forward and be with Jesus. That, that prophetic word at the beginning that Sarah brought about being on the, on the float of the river and, and then Gail came to sound, jump in the river. Jump into the river. If you just want to come forward and jump in the river, come forward and jump in the river. The King is here. Jesus is here.
Let's worship. Let's worship this amazing truth. Wow.